There's a whole series of parallels today with 1936. You have to go back to 1936 to find people worrying so much about hunger and about food. You have to go back to 1936 to find the same distribution of income, the same level of inequality as we have today. There are lots of ways in which we are back the 1930s, except the black, the black shirts are not marching in London. There's a few of them in the cabinet. But there aren't a set of people in this city who will march for this, particularly amongst the young. I get nasty letters and emails from racists. I always reply to them. In most cases, I eventually get their postcode. It's a small village in the middle of nowhere where everybody is white and they are old. Right? There are lots of things that are quietly getting better at the same time as we're becoming shattered. Uh, I haven't got any pictures for you because there are no pictures in the book. And I wanted just to tell you some stories instead from it. Uh, it begins with a story about me. I was born in Oxford in 1968. I was born between uh, a cemetery and a shopping centre to the south of the city, if you know it at all. And my earliest memories are of people smiling. Lots of people smiling. And then later, my mum holding my hand in a death grip because she was determined to talk for another 20 minutes to somebody in County Centre. But people were happy. There was full employment. If you got a job in a car factory, you could buy a house, you could start a family in your 20s. If you didn't like your job, you could tell them to stuff it. There have been a lot of strikes. In one year, I think as many as 600 strikes, which is a lot of strikes, although nothing like the 1920s, where there were far more. But those strikes were largely, in the short term, successful. Wages in most years in the 1970s went up by more than inflation. People were better off each year, even in the 1970s. Life expectancy was higher in Sheffield than it was in England on average, which is why Rastoff and the Full Monty have such an effect that it's not so much a story of South Yorkshire falling apart, the South Yorkshire losing what it actually had. Poverty was low and falling in the 1970s. Poverty had actually got worse between 1901 and 1936. Seaborne Mountry's uh, survey of York had showed that, and it shocked people when his survey of 1936 showed no improvement from 1901, but he did another one in 1952, and he found it almost impossible to find much poverty as it was defined then. And the Roundtree's family story is indicative of what happened in Britain. Uh, Seaborn's dad was Joseph. Joseph, if you like, was Willy Wonka. He was the one who owned the chocolate factory in York. Joseph's father had set up one of the first soup kitchens in York in the 1850s. Joseph saw what his father had done watched the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 1880s, 1890s, and when he came to write his will, he said whatever the foundation that was going to be set up in his name did, it must not spend money on soup kitchens, because you had to get rid of soup kitchens. And then his son would actually chart the ending of the soup kitchens by the 1950s, fewer in the 1960s, gone by the 1970s. So we've lived through eras of incredible progress that has been fought for and won, that is often slandered. Now, uh, there's a series of podcasts. I published an article yesterday about one. They're always done by pairs of men. Uh, the one, and they always you have to go to private school to be allowed to do one of these podcasts. Um, <laughs> Ed Balls and George Osborne is the one I've written about. But Dominic Sandbrook, 
and Tom, what's his name? Holland, is it? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're the rest is history one, right? These are smug Wikipedia-generated soundbite histories of 1968 or the Spanish Civil War, written and performed by people with a particular view of the world and view of history, where the 1970s were the worst time ever, as far as they were concerned. Let's go forward. I'm aged 18 in 1986. I have to do my math to work it out. Um, I leave Oxford. My year was the last year when almost all the boys in my school were taken on to work in the car factory. Car factories that employed with the supplying factories as well, almost 40,000 people, mostly men. Oxford is a city, a Midlands industrial city, in which life was good, it had never been better, but my year was the last year in which you could simply walk into a job. Unemployment came for the boys in the year below me. Heroin came two years later, down from the north. Sweeping down from the Clyde and from the Tyne and across from Belfast was the industrialization and drugs came in its wake. I hopped over that time. I went to Newcastle at the age of 18 and I stayed there for 10 years. I walked into a city as a student where 60% of households had nobody in work. This was my education. I can sometimes forgive Ed Balls and George Osborne and all the rest of them of my generation of men who did the opposite to me and they turned up at my age at the University of Oxford. They had have no idea what was happening to the rest of the country. Maybe they should have educated themselves but they could create their own little world inside the university where some of them were tough and working class even if they had gone to the private school and others were toffs, although not quite tough enough in George's uh, case to avoid being called an oik uh, by the proper uh, public school boys. They lived in their own little world. Meanwhile, up in Newcastle, poverty had deepened. I lived in Forden and then Benwell and then Fenham and then Low Eaton and then High Eaton. Moved around a city that was very cheap to live in, but where hope had actually died. I moved down in 1996 to Bristol. I got my first uh, serious academic job in Bristol. And at that time, if any of you know it, Bristol was an area that was being redeveloped. The docks were just about to be gentrified. They were just beginning to build the luxury flats on the key sides, but you had a sense that this was only going to involve some people and not others. A year later, I was part of a very large group of people in Bristol Northwest who campaigned for a change of government. Bristol Northwest, Labour were third place. The city MP was William Waldegrave. The Liberals were second. We took Labour from third to first in 1997. And uh, a candidate who really hadn't wanted to be an MP suddenly found themselves with a job. I went to the Labour Party party that night. And at 10 o'clock, the exit poll was broadcast on the giant screen. And Tony Robinson, who well, you'll know him better as Baldrick from Blackadder, Baldrick from Blackadder comes out to celebrate to all these Labour Party workers what has happened. I wasn't a member of the Labour Party at that point. I joined at 15, but at 18 I had walked into a Labour club in Newcastle. And luckily, before I even opened my mouth and revealed what a complete prat I was, everybody put their beer down and it went silent. And that was the end of my Labour Party membership for quite a long time. Uh, and I walked out of the Labour Club quietly, realising that my very trendy long leather jacket might have given me away. 
The exit poll, 10 p.m., Bristol, 1997. The poll comes out, it's going to be a landslide for Labour. These people have spent weeks and weeks campaigning for this. I expected them to be jubilant. A giant picture of Tony Blair appears on the screen and the booze began from the back of the hall at the Labour Party party in 1997 and I was utterly shocked. The booze came from the older people, the people who knew, the people who wanted to get Wardergrave out. But they already knew that Tony Blair wasn't going to be good news. And, and this is a shock for young me, and I thought, oh, you must be wrong. Okay. They're going to keep two years of conservative spending. They felt they had the promise that to get elected. But they're going to reduce child poverty, aren't they? They're going to make us more equal. And they, and they did do something. They replaced an awfully large amount of double glazing in council houses. They just weren't very proud of it, so they didn't tell anybody. But they didn't reduce inequality one iota. Not in 98 or 99 or 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It never moved by more than 1%, which was the error in the sample that's used to work it out. They failed to actually reduce child poverty in any meaningful way. Statistically, they moved quite a few children, a few pounds over a line that nobody actually noticed. They brought in university tuition fees. They funded a war overseas. They began to increase the amount of privatisation in the health service that had already begun. They were the grown-ups in the room. This was real politics, it's what you had to do, but don't worry because we're going to have a thriving international banking sector and the trickle down from the banks is going to be redistributed to all those less deserving, not quite so clever, not quite so able people who didn't all meet in the Labour Club at the University of Oxford in 1986. But the banks crashed in 2008, and that little dream ended. And all the while, we were slowly going up the ranks of inequality in Europe. By 2009, we'd beaten Portugal. We were the most unequal country in the whole of Western Europe. A few years later, um, I'm afraid I can't help but be nerdy over the stats on all these things, that's my job. A few years later, we almost beat Bulgaria. We're still just there to become the most unequal country in the whole of Europe by income. But you don't stay at that plateau and nothing happens. What happens if you're prepared to tolerate and live with this level of inequality is that things slowly begin to shatter and fall apart because it is not sustainable. In 1999, I moved up to Leeds, which was having its own mini housing and finance boom. But the finance boom in the, in the back office functions of the City of London was only felt in certain parts of that city. In 2003, I moved to Sheffield. So it's an incredibly divided city where the university acts as a barrier to separate the richer parts from the poorer parts. Um, if you were to go around Sheffield in 2003, 4, 5, or 6, you might notice at one point, finally, when they'd run out of spending money on the middle of Leeds, and they'd put the Shard building in the middle of Newcastle, all the very centres were, were tarted up. Eventually, they did a little bit of rebuilding of the, of the station in the middle of Sheffield, and they put up some very nice lyrics from Jarvis Cocker on the sides of some of the skyscrapers but not much else got better. I could pick up a visitor at the station in Sheffield in those years, and I could say, we can go west, which is where we're going to the university, but if you want to see a car burning, you pick north, south, or east, and I guarantee you within 25 minutes, we will find a burning car. And it wasn't an over-exaggeration. Admittedly, I knew which streets to go to, but it takes quite a lot of burning of cars to 
provide a kind of ready spectacle for social science academics to be able to show people. Right? These are the depressing things. We'll get onto the hope in a minute. Right? <laughs> but I just have to give you a sense of the going downhill. We went from my childhood, from being the second most equal country of any size in Europe after Sweden, we were Nordic, to becoming the most unequal. We went from when I was born of having the highest life expectancy in the world, if you exclude six countries whose total population combined is less than ours. I was born in a place with the lowest infant mortality on the planet. Right? It's as near to you can get to utopia. We were making the schools open. You could go to school with the people who lived on your street. Incredible things had happened. Went from that to a country which is now 36 in the international rankings of life expectancy and falling. Or if you look at neonatal mortality, your chance of dying in the four weeks of life, there are five Eastern European countries still doing worse than us. But odds on in the next eight years, Romania will be better than we are for a baby's chance of survival. Let's just be miserable for five minutes and I'll get it out of my system. Um, maternal mortality has risen by 20% in the last few years. Why has it risen by 20%? The main reason is increased suicides amongst the mothers in this country. Life expectancy peaked in 2014, fell in 2015, was still below 2014 and 2016. In 2019, for a very few months, it managed just to beat 2014, partly because the winter was exceptionally warm. The government blamed it on flu, a special British flu we got that only affected us and didn't seem to affect hardly anywhere else in Europe. Of course, it was austerity in the cuts. The Meals and Wheels services went when the coalition came in, aided and abetted by the Liberals. This is a kind of, of curse on all your houses. Right. Adult social workers were cut and cut again. We had decimation of local authorities. You know this all now. I don't really need to tell you, but somebody might complain, you know, why didn't I? Were you surprised when Birmingham, the largest local authority in Europe, went bust and they've got to sell everything they can by Christmas just to pay the wages of the people they are forced to employ? In the book, the example is Slough. Because Birmingham came a few months too late for me to include it. But there were another 20 odd I could have put in there. And there will be another 30 by Christmas. I didn't know at the time of writing the book that there would be nearly 200 schools not fully opened or not opened at all because the concrete could at any time crash down on the children's heads. But at least we are not making the children sit in those halls. You know, it could be worse. There's a college in Oxford where they'll be dining in a tent all autumn because it's made of the same concrete. Um, which might be good for them. <laughs> uh, well, it's a better education than they got in 1986, isn't it? And they're different. They're different, the students at Oxford now. For the start, 70% of our class are from state schools, so between the posh state schools, but still state schools. 70% state, 30% private. That's the undergraduates. They're not cocksure anymore. They are nervous, they are frightened. They cannot see a safe future from them. I'm not going to get onto the environment at all, but it's not just that. The world is no longer aligned so that their futures are guaranteed. We may have finally got to the end of that long line of prime ministers where, in one day, just to really bore you, I'll learn it by heart and recite it. But you can take each one, you can take Boris and say, who was Prime Minister when he was 18 in Oxford? And you go, oh yes, yes, that was Margaret. And who was Prime Minister when she was 19 in Oxford? And you go, oh yes, that was Winston. And uh, he didn't go, of course, because the boys of that particular kind in Harrow were sent to Sandhurst. But who was Prime Minister when Winston was 18? Oh, it's another Tory. It's amazing how far you can take that particular line down. I suspect this isn't going to carry on. I'm optimistic. But audience participation. Uh, you get to choose. Want, squalor, ignorance, 
eigenvessel disease. What do you want first? We do five minutes on each, and then we do questions. <laughs> so, squalor, squalor. Squalor first. Somebody's got to keep count to make sure I don't miss one of these. Squalor was the old evil of sun housing. 90% of people were, rented, were privately renting, something like that, in most of England in the 1930s. It was terrible. Which is why we introduced council housing. And by 1946, the majority of children in this country at one point or another lived in a council house in their childhood. We know that from the birth cohort study because we follow the children born in one week for their lives from that. So when anybody tells you I grew up in a council house, you just say, you were normal, and you're the majority. You know, that wasn't that special. Uh, we have the most progressive social housing building in the, in the world. The rest of the world copied it. The Americans didn't like it. They had a word with Margaret. She said she sorted, she did, and the right to buy. Our housing now, and the reasons may be more complicated than this, but, but now you know. One in 29 people are homeless at the moment in Kensington uh, and Chelsea. Officially homeless, according to the records of local authority. We're back to the pre-pandemic level. Happens to be the constituency of the housing minister. I doubt she even knows it's a statistic. She's a member of the Chelsea Arts Club. Uh, you can look it up on a register of interests of what she's actually interested in. She's a banker. The black mould is spreading because people can't put the heating on. So every winter the black mould gets worse and we're getting deaths, increasing uh, numbers of deaths <coughs> because of the condition our housing is in. The amount of unfit for human habitation, housing is rising and rising. It's dire. So what can you do about it? Because we're going to start doing hope. We have, as a 2021 census revealed, more bedrooms per person than ever before. You can click on the ONS website. You can go onto the 2021 census website. You can pull up a map, a map of your local area, because that's the thing we're most interested in. And you can have a look at the streets, each street around you, to see how many people have got two or three spare empty bedrooms. And it's stunning. Uh, it's absolutely stunning to see how much we've got. You may think, oh, I need them at Christmas. How on earth am I going to do Christmas? You know, and I'm trying to think, does everybody rotate and do Christmas all in a turn to the fence? It's only like one Christmas in four, isn't it, really? And you need that second house to relax, don't you? and the one in London as well for when you're in work. And the holiday home is the holiday home. We have almost all the housing we actually need. We just have to encourage people not to hog it, not to hoard it. Lord Tebbit, Lord Tebbit was complaining to his chauffeur a few years ago as his chauffeur drove him from the House of Lords of why was he having to drive so far to get home past all these windows that were dark because nobody clearly lived there. And I don't know how Lord Tebbit's doing now, but I would like the opportunity to explain to him what happened and whose fault it was. Um, a few small wealth taxes, a little bit of progressive council taxation, changing the rules just a little bit so you don't get less tax if you're there on your own or if it's your holiday home. It's beginning in Wales, it's beginning in other areas. They're doing it. You can look to the Scottish Government if you want to know how to begin to control private landlords. This won't be the last time tonight I mention the Scottish Government. Uh, but you need fundamentally a government where the central, most important, expensive, overriding economic aim which was told to me by a senior official in the Treasury 20 years into my career, 20 years after I've been a housing research fellow for the Roundtree Foundation, the most important economic aim in this country is to make housing as expensive as possible, particularly in London, because that's how we know we've succeeded. 
That is the measure of success as an economy. If you've got the most expensive housing in Europe, you must be the best place in Europe. If you can't afford to live in London, well, the great thing about the house prices is they're going to sort the wheat from the chaff. That kind of thinking has underpinned our economic policy. That's why we spend billions and billions on health to buy, to pop up the house prices. It's why Labour in 2009 cut half the regional aid budget to put it into the mortgage rescue scheme to the southeast of England to hold house prices up. And an official phoned me up then and said, have I noticed? And I said, no, I haven't. And I began to work out why he was a bit worried, because I might have noticed, but it didn't matter because he lost the election anyway. You do not spend billions trying to keep house prices up. You let them fall, preferably slowly. I'm not a revolutionary. Slowly to the level that Germany has. You increase regulations on landlords. Eventually to the level that Germany has. Or you can pick Vienna, or you could choose what they do in the Netherlands, or you could go to Sweden. In fact, a bit like me picking up those businesses and driving in any direction to see a burning car. We could put a pin in the map of Europe and the housing policy would be better. There's so much you could do. We do need to build council houses. And I was asked this morning for a policy paper to put a target. How many should we build? And you would build it with the money that you were making from taxing the mansions and taxing people who wanted to have a six-bedroom house but living on their own. You let them do that. I'm a liberal. Bitch. L. Um, you don't requisition or throw anybody out, but you just have to pay for the privileges of using up space because it's finite. Mm -hmm. right? It's not like space on the internet. Mm -hmm. If you decide that you want to have a large house in the middle of London and leave, leave it empty, somebody else is going to be so preserving. Or to the exact a quarter of a million people between 16 and 24 will be so preserving because you decide to do that. So you can generate money to build council housing, most of which is going to have to be apartments, flat, no stairs, because we're getting old. It has to be near to where people live, because when you get old, the more thing you've got to your friends and family. And you do not want to go and live somewhere far away just because the Green Party thinks it's ecological that you do so. So we do need the council house building programme. But when asked this morning to say what should the number be, I said it all depends on Jeremy Hunt. If he is spectacularly stupid, as he was at the end of the last budget speech, when he said that Britain has always and is now a force for good in the world, that's Jeremy Hunt's history lessons that he has taught at his school and at his college, you know, he actually believes it. We've always been a force for good. You know, I worry because I would like Hunt to be a little bit clever and to take on Starmer, which wouldn't be hard. But if Hunt is really not very able, and Sunak isn't, supposing the pound was the tank after they hear what they've got to say in their autumn budget, in that case we're not doing a house building programme because we can't buy any girders or concrete. We're putting up tents in 2024 and 2026. But, and here's the optimism, I'll try and ramp it up for the next four. <laughs> but, we are accepting that the experiment has ended and it has failed. The value of our housing, which is falling in real terms fast than it's fall for decades because of inflation, was illusionary anyway because there was nobody who could afford to buy it. Even the private landlords are try trying to quietly offload what they have at the moment because they cannot afford the interest rates, the interest rates which were announced this morning if you haven't been in the government and you need to borrow some money, you can borrow it on a 30-year loan. You'll be charged 5% by the international money markets. That's enormous for a government, 5%. The money has run out. When the government gave BMW in Oxford 75 million so they wouldn't move to China with the electric mini, it would be shut in 2030, which is what they're planning to do. 75 million goes to BMW one day. It's commercially secret, but once minister actually leaked it and then they keep on saying it's secret. Why did you tell the newspaper then? <laughs> on the same day they gave them 75 million, they cut the social security budget of the country by 150 million. Not because they're psychotic and callous necessarily, because to stop the interest rate going up at which we have to borrow money,
That's what they had or felt they had to do. But we've got all the houses. The Luftwaffe haven't just come over. They're there. We can actually house everybody who needs a house. But there's a hell of a lot of things we need to do. Last contrast on squalor, and then we're going fast in the four. When you think things are not possible. Student housing. Something like 65% of people are going to university by the age of 30 now. The majority of them are not staying at home. And the majority of those private student flats which have been built where they pay seven, eight, nine thousand pounds a year for the most expensive ensuite toilet in your life are owned by people registered in Guernsey and Jersey. Well, you can end that. You can end that as a stroke of a pen. And if you don't think you can end these things, look at what happened to further education last year. We nationalised it all. The way we nationalise things in England is very subtle. The Office of National Statistics reclassifies you as no longer being quasi-private, but says because so much of your income is coming from the state, you are, you are part of the public sector. And on the same day, in the same hour as the Office of National Statistics does that, Michael Gove sends a letter to the heads of all housing associations saying you are now part of the Toyol Further Education Colleges, or St. Michael, it was the Education Secretary, um, saying you are now part of my department, you can borrow no money at all without our permission, in fact, you can't borrow any money. But on top of that, there's an implicit message which is nobody in the public sector should be paid more than the Prime Minister, which is a bit of a headache for the further education colleges. My Freudian slip for housing associations is that in a way they're next. They're incredibly expensive, we have too many of them, they pay their chief executives too much. But here's the problem. If the Office of National Statistics were to look at housing associations and say, Rather like further education colleges, the vast majority of your income comes from the state through housing benefit. You're not a private thing, we're going to be classifying you for the purposes of national accounts. And Michael Gove, correctly in this case, would send them all the letter. Our public debt would rise so much that the international money markets would take fright. Anyway, these are the kind of problems that we are dealing with in the next few years. So, shout me out another one. What? What? What was one of the two children in the Christmas Carol, I think? Uh, some of these problems are very old. Charles Dickens had a child called Want. Want is poverty. Uh, want is, is not having enough. Want was what the Beveridge Report in 1942 sought to eradicate. These five evils come from Beveridge. And again, for hope, William Beveridge was the eugenicist snob who really didn't particularly like women that told them that they should, if they were middle class and white, have four children for the good of the race. Right? William Beveridge was not a particularly progressive man, as you might have guessed, because he was Master of University College, Oxford. And yet, along with a Tory health minister, who was actually in favour of the National Health Service, and a load of Labour people, they all moved. All the parties moved together in a particular direction. And we got the report in 42, we abolished the poor law, I think it's in 1948, somebody who knows is sitting in the audience, which is always disconcerting when you're trying to remember these things. We reduced poverty enormously in both relative and absolute terms. What do we have now? Stephanie Flanders, hardly a biased commentator. Stephanie works for Bloomberg TV, used to work for a bank when she left the BBC. Stephanie Flanders is in a secure enough position to be able to say that when you look at the numbers, the poorest people in Britain are poorer, the poorest fifth, are poorer than most of the poorest fifth in Eastern Europe. Um, the Resolution Foundation, not revolutionary at all. At the start of this year, at least the fact that 56%, in other words, the majority of children in the UK who've got a brother and a sister, or a brother and a brother, or sister and a sister, that's the mistake they've made. They've got two or more siblings. 56% of them are going hungry two or three times every month. The heights of our children are falling, and they're becoming stunted unlike anywhere else in Europe. That's once. That's back to Dickens. That's now. So what can you do about it? 
immediately, straight away, it's really easy. Really easy for children. You can look at Scotland. There was a lovely woman who at school was a wham family in Glasgow. And she had two ambitions. One ambition was an independent Scotland, the other was to eliminate child poverty in Scotland. You all know about the independence of Scotland, you might even know about a caravan, you know, but nobody quite knows who got the caravan. You'd work out how many caravans you could buy for the PF, PF scandal, but anyway. She called the Scottish equivalent of Cobra to deal with the cost of living crisis, and they met every week. They introduced a special payment for children in Scotland, which initially was only £10 a week for children aged under six. But they increased it, and then they increased it again in November of last year. This is very recent. So it's now £25 for every child you have aged under 16 if you are in receipt of any form of benefit and it is not tapered, which means you get the money, you keep the money, you don't lose the money if you're getting anything else. But a family of three in Scotland by this November, which is just two months away, that is £4,000 extra for a family of three. No child in Scotland need go cold or hungry this Christmas. When I give this talk to university students with lots of graphs and uh, less opinion and being whatever impartial you have to do, I get them to guess what this country is. I just show them the benefit levels and they normally start off with two or three of the Nordic countries before they begin to realise, okay, he's doing a fascinating that it's not Danny's favourite Nordic countries. <laughs> and then they jump to Germany and France and the Netherlands, and on average it takes them 10 countries before they get to Scotland. The Gini coefficient for child inequality in Scotland has gone from the worst in Europe to equal to Finland by November. As long as they get the money, the money you give it to the mother, by the way. Yeah. The mother, this is basic rule with money and children. Um, <coughs> it's an emergency thing. It's cheap, it's costed, you can see how much it costs. If you are the properly taxed, the uh, pension benefits of the highest paid university professors and hospital consultants and private business people in Scotland, you can just pay it out of that. Uh, just their pension relief they get and their pension is worth more than a million. It's peanuts. Of course it is, it's 25 pounds a week per child. It wouldn't even get you a few tens of miles of HS2. But it stops the children going hungry, and we will measure it, because we're interested. How many more centimetres of height are they going to gain this stop? You have to bring the inequality down. It's not rocket science. There is no way, and sadly the Roundtree Foundation still have a burden, this, there is no way you can reduce poverty and have high inequality. But it is not hard to bring the inequality down. But you have to take people with you, tell them why you're doing it, tell them it's an emergency. If Hunt and Sunak are not, as I've described to you, the more able, then in the last 30 seconds of the budget this autumn, they will announce the introduction the next day of an emergency sovereign take back control Britain is best levy, whatever they call it, a wealth tax. They will set it at a level where the only member of parliament who has to pay it will be Rishi himself. Rishi will then go, then go on after Hunter's analysis. You could also levy, by the way, the 10 richest Oxford and Cambridge colleges, 10% of their endowment in the richest schools as well to make it fair. Rishi will then go on immediately after Hunt and explain, don't worry, my main job for most of my life was to help people avoid paying tax. I really do know how to stop them avoiding this one. And they can begin to play a game with Starmer and just go, you know, how much does Labour believe that the wealthy need to be protected? Um, it's not impossible. Depends how much the Tories really would like to win an election. And also, 
how they run out of every other option because we cannot borrow the money anymore. So there are things we can do. We've got to speed up. Next one. Ignorance. Ignorance. That's a big one. It is big. Let's just go to the, okay, well, we privatise the schools with the academies. They run as car dealerships. Um, that's just most of the state ones, and soon the majority of the primary schools will be done the same. The universities are businesses. Although, remember what happened to further education last year? I kind of look forward to helping a future government nationalise my university. Um, which never happened. But we've not been in this situation for a long time uh, before. We now sell qualifications. The example I give in the book is Manchester. Just how many overseas students are coming to Manchester and how much they are paying for this. But this isn't really an education, and this is blasphemous for somebody who works in the university to say. Germany, five or ten years ago, had more overseas students than us, 330,000. Didn't charge them a penny. Didn't charge them a penny. Because in Germany, education isn't about profit in the business. It's about this weird thing called learning. Why do they want so many overseas students? Well, it made it much more interesting if they were there in the classes. Go to Finland, and not only if you're from the rest of the EU do you not have to pay, but you're number one on the housing list because you don't have parents who live in the country. By the way, the housing list has all Finnish students. 90% are in the council house. The council house is a one-bedroom apartment. The bed is a double bed. The apartment includes a kitchen and a large ensuite toilet. And you pay a pittance for it. And Finland, because of course Finland is such an incredibly wealthy country with its huge colonial history, that's why they can afford to do this. <laughs> uh, let's not dig myself any further uh, down the hole of ignorance. I haven't even touched the private schools. But they're just a small part of it. The rest of the world doesn't happen, by the way. The rest of Europe hardly exists. Only one country in the world in the OECD has more than we do, and that's Chile. Um, we divide our children in the form of apartheid. You do not see us. Where with the vice within the private sector, if you don't pass the engine exams, people pay money to put their children through exams so they can know they failed. <laughs> Not just at age 13 or age 11, but you know, you have an entrance exam for press. You really want to screw up a whole generation so they become psychotically bad ministers. <laughs> it is an awful way to do it. Let's go to the fourth one. Which was? Oh, well, there's two more, see, so I'm remembering. <laughs> We don't want, we don't ignorance. Uh, uh, we've got idleness and disease. Yeah, I, I call, I rename them in the book if I'm not going to go through that. Uh, idleness, though, has changed. Idleness was mass unemployment in the 1930s. We had three, maybe four million unemployed. The US, they lost count. They actually sacked the people counting the unemployed at one point. And so we don't have a top figure for US unemployment in the 30s. Uh, but it was men in middle age in the 30s. Our unemployment, the three million in the 1980s, was mainly young people, which was partly how they got away with it. Uh, now we have maybe the lowest rate of unemployment in Europe. We also have the lowest unemployment benefit, which might explain why we have the lowest rate of unemployment, because it's not an option. You can't live on it, and if you try to, they'll sanction you anyway if you go to apply for that many jobs. So the new ignorance is people doing any job they can for longer hours than they should be doing or on their second or third job and doing it really badly. Um, you know, it is entirely wasteful organising things in this way. The best countries in Europe have a form of benefit if you do lose your job, equivalent to what we introduced during the pandemic. Right? We go, isn't it amazing? Can you imagine paying people 80% of what they normally get and they don't have to work? In some places that's just normal and it's what you would want if you if you could not work. Right, let's end on disease. <laughs> My favourite. <laughs> um, but sorry. Hope for uh, people being forced to do work that they don't want to do. The long term aim is basic income. 
it's been written about the thousands of books. It is a sort of ridiculous idea of suggesting in 1870 that you should pay people unemployment benefit rather than having paupers. Right? In the 1870s and 1880s, the idea of unemployment benefit would seem like pie in the sky. The idea of a basic income where you've given enough money so that you can heat your home and feed yourself but not do very much else, but you can start your own band or write poetry or write that book that nobody's going to read or whatever you like. That seems as though we can't possibly do that. The economy wouldn't work. <coughs> Although our carbon footprint would sink very, very rapidly, which isn't a bad thing to do. We've already experimented with the four-day week. We know that people are more productive than when they work four days than five. There's a whole series of basic income experiments that have worked. It is just obvious. You do not want to be working in a building with people who do not want to be working. It doesn't make it a productive place. You want to be working with someone that other people want to be working with you and want to be doing that job. Then they do it well. Then they're innovative. Then suddenly you find that what the line is becoming better. You find that the teaching is better in your university if the people really want to be there and want to be teaching. Rather than writing the articles they have to write to keep their job and their next success. Right? So some of these things really are very obvious. Disease. The last one. As I told you, we have an incredibly good record. And then in 2012, for the first time, the life expectancy of women over 65 began to fall. And it fell by two weeks. I wrote a letter that appeared in the New Statesman, an article that appeared in February 2014, and Public Health England put its lawyers onto me. Because I'd implied that they got it wrong over the cause, which apparently was influenza and flu. And I was casting some kind of a slur over their medical expertise. No okay, I'm only a geographer. Yeah. But you don't expect to get a letter threatening you with the lawyers for writing an article about life expectancy in the New Statesman. Uh, thank you for Helen Lewis, the deputy editor, who has a backbone, and told me you just tell them where to go. Later, the man who wrote me the letter ended up for two weeks in charge of the entire vaccine program during the pandemic, after which he was sacked because he was so incompetent. <laughs> not that I hold a grudge. I won't name him. <laughs> it's not kind, given the failure of his entire career. Um, <laughs> Name him, Professor John Newton. <laughs> in charge of Public Health England. Why? Why did we have Public Health England? We brought it in from America as an idea. It was all about having an agency that did two things. One thing it did was to tell you not to be so fat, eat less, exercise and don't smoke, because public health was all about the individual. That's why it came in. And its second job was to be ready in case of an event outside of all of our control, right? And what it wasn't to do is talk about the underlying actual causes of ill health and why things have got worse. Well, it didn't do a very good job when the individual getting thinner and so on things. We haven't been very good at that. They're thinner in every other country in Europe. We're not fatter because we're slovenly. We're fatter because it's just so dire getting through life that an extra packet of crisps really, really helps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> put it bluntly. But they certainly were found to be absolutely wanting when the main part of their job came along and hit them, like a ton of bricks. Because it turned out really Public Health England were not there for public health at all. They were there to pretend you were doing something about public health. Well, like Boris Johnson, when he was asked, what did he really do as Mayor of London, said nothing. That was the point. You don't want to interfere. The market is best. You've got to do some stunts and appear as if you're doing something, but the really important thing is to do nothing. He wasn't lazy, he was just completely dedicated to the belief and to the mission uh, of what it should be. So, we hit the top of the league tables, we're taking them out of the presents. Let's not go through the list because I promise you hope. What can we do about it? How can we get out? Well, most of these things, most of these things are caused by the state in which we're living. So that if you begin to sort housing, so people are not suffering from poor mental health because they're in such fear of can they hold on to the house they're in, they will become healthier. If you increase freedom over whether you have to work at all, they become healthier. 
if you give access to actual good educational opportunities, rather than hoops you have to jump to and perform to get the nines and the eights and GCSEs or the two ones or firsts, then your education system isn't a generator of poor mental health, it actually makes people feel better about themselves. Right? So most of the, of the problem with health is simply the rest of society. But you do have to build 40 hospitals, because we're getting older. And those 40 hospitals are going to have to appear. And we are going to need a larger health service. But how are we going to afford that? I'll give you a clue. Finland now has the record in the world for the lowest child mortality rates on the planet. 2015 is when they got it. And it's a spectacular record. This is the uh, least grieving parents in the whole of human history in that country. In Finland, if you find you've got a lump or a bump and you need it investigated or an operation, if you're lucky, it's two or three days. If you're really unlucky, it's three or four weeks' wait. It's an efficient health service. And here's the rub. They pay their doctors and nurses less than we pay ours. So how are they doing this magic in Finland? They don't need to be paid for. Because everybody else is paid less who are in those well-respected jobs. The teachers are paid less than our teachers for providing the best educational resource in the world. But the people who work in the private sector are paid less at the top, not two, three or four times the average, but two, two and a half times at the most. The amount of money you save by being a more equal country is astronomical. Our top 10% takes 40% of all income every year. It's incredibly expensive. And the doctors have to get that money, or it's really hard for them to not feel they have to, because they often come from backgrounds which means they're not used to living on the poorer half of town. And so on. It's just... But you can level everybody together. You cannot level individual... Uh, occupations one at a time. But we have been doing that. So here's the good news. You might not like me for this. Have we got any senior civil servants in the room? Can we admit? Hopefully sneaked up. Okay. That's good. You're not going to be embarrassed. Well, it's very embarrassing to talk about money in England. Uh, if you're an average senior civil servant, your income in real terms has dropped by 25% since 2008. You are a quarter poorer. Any junior civil servants in the room? We won't do it. Your, your average income, you know it's lower in real terms. You can buy less beer. And it's dropped by 12%. So the drop's been less, and the gap between the higher paid and the lower paid has reduced. Not just for the civil service, but for everybody working for British Telecom. The same in universities, the same for the teachers, where the pay deals have been tiered. The same in the Telegraph, Times, Daily Mail and Express newspapers, which are the only ones I've managed to get out of them. Where if you're paid under 60, you get a 3% or whatever, 4 or 5% on that pay, but anything above that, nothing. You keep the same as you had last year, which means actually 10% less. Inflation can be an enormous leveller when you've run out of money, because you increase the wages at the bottom, because you have to, because you can't have them coming in start. You don't increase the wages at the top because you've got no money left. You increase the state pension because you have to, because it is still a business. There is no problem with the state pension, we can increase it a lot more. We need to get it to a level where everybody can imagine relying on it. The problem is the private pensions. And you increase benefits by inflation because you have to, because you don't want to see emaciated bodies. This is like the 1930s again. We're becoming more equal, it's incredibly painful, nobody is happy about it, but it is underway already. The big difference, let's end on this because I've talked for long enough, the big difference is that they didn't know what was happening in the 30s. They didn't have a clue and they didn't know where they were heading to, and they had the black shirts marching, and they knew a war was coming. The big difference is that we've seen this before. And we have all those other countries of Europe which are doing things so much better than us. And we had hope between 2015 and 2019 that an alternative was being proposed. And that's not me standing up here saying, 
2015-2019 was a wonderful period for hope in one political party, David Cameron's happiness index actually proves it. When half a million people joined the Labour Party and millions of others decided it was a good idea, the happiness of the country actually went up. The biggest recorded drop in Cameron's happiness index occurred in September, October, November, and particularly December 2019. The number of people who said that life is worth living fell faster than ever measured before by early December 2019. The levels of anxiety reached a peak they had never reached before in December 2019. Later in March, there was a tiny increase in anxiety when a disease swept across the country that you had no idea what its death rate may be. And the election of Boris Johnson in 2019 caused the biggest decrease in happiness and hope that we have ever measured. And that is a brilliant thing. Because the British people on average are not fascist, racist, angry, small boat haters, who think there's no such thing as society but only them and their families. Enough people get frightened enough and told that the alternative is some kind of terrorist cabal. We'll vote for the Conservatives and only two million will stay at home. But they weren't happy. They were the least happy we've ever measured them at the point that Johnson got his landslide victory in December 2019. And that unhappiness of the population is a sign of hope. You do not live among people who are joyously going, Britannia 2.0, take back control, we must vote number one again. That isn't what most people believe in and what they want. But they're exhausted, they can't see a way out of this, they don't believe it's possible, they can't learn from the history where we did this before, and we always look to America, we never look to the mainland. Thank you for letting me talk at you for so long. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is we're going to have a couple of questions. Um, Danny's books are available, and I'm just going to fast forward a couple of slides. If you were in any doubt as to Danny's back catalogue of work, that picture should show it all. Um, we have current copies of Shattered Nation at the front. Danny will be signing afterwards. Christmas isn't very far away. May not be everyone's idea of a Christmas present. <laughs> but it's better than socks, and it's an incredible book, and it's incredible. We are so lucky to have Danny here. Any questions? Paul at the front. Uh, well, Joe, um... Why? <laughs> <laughs> we are going to invoke the Guardian's rule of questions, which is, if you have to breathe halfway through, that's the end of your question. <laughs> You said about 15 to 90, and you say in the book that you get a Tory government, you get a Tory government, you get Labour there further to the right, and then you go further right and further right. What do you, do you see a prospect with Starmer? And do you see a role for universal basic income in levelling up at all? Okay, uh, definitely a role for universal basic income. We began it anyway. We began it with child benefit, pension and credits. We, we had universal basic income for a large proportion of the population at the level. Then they enrolled it. Uh, but they didn't enrol it in Scotland and Northern Ireland. When I first began working on this in the 80s, Scotland had the worst child poverty rate in the UK. Can you guess? Which region of England has a higher child poverty rate than Scotland? And if you want to guess which one. Yeah, London has. These are the regions, you know, South Norfolk. Region, right? East Anglia. Very good. Yeah, East Anglia has got more child poverty. Cornwall's got more child poverty. Find me, find me the part of England which has got lower child poverty in Scotland. None. I'll give it away. None. The south east of England has higher child poverty rates than Scotland. Right. Unbelievable. That is just un unbelievable. Uh, universal basic income uh, is the first. Starmer is unpredictable. That's a great hope. I he doesn't do what he says. Um, but I, I don't think he sees these things as stark as me. And the quick answer to this question is, in 2015, 
George Osborne made a promise that if we followed his economic plan by the end of the year 2030, we will be the richest large country by per capita GDP in the world. When Johnson gave his resignation speech, he ended with the promise of the Sunday Putnams, and how, I don't think he said 2030, but he said soon, if we keep to the promise, we will be the richest country in slightly different formula. And this summer, Starmer said, if you do what he believes in, then we will have the highest growth rate of all the G7, right? Now, hopefully Starmer realised that that was complete tosh. Um, and he may have done, because he had people telling him there is absolutely no way the state of Britain's in. The fact we could only just hold on to a German car, a car company by bribing them 75 million, which they do not have to repay, right? Um, but my worry about Starmer is he might actually believe the same things as George Osborne and Boris Johnson, in which case it's going to get worse. Anyone else? Someone's got another question. Um, as somebody who teaches the children that come to the university, do you find that they actually care or have much awareness about this? I find that they don't. I wonder if you find that they care much about it. Because that's another maybe sick headings care. I just don't feel that they know. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, 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 that's a good question. Um, well, it, it's very different being a teacher. Um, where they're very interested in you and they don't just want to tell you your opinion so, so I get to go into schools and I get to do talks like this and I'm a little bit careful yeah. um, but let me tell you if you don't tell anybody else the school I did it on Monday was Eton College I had 200 in Eton in their big hall first time I've been there it's worth it, you change one boy in Eton the multiplier effect is enormous I'll, I'll go every week um, I've been three times, first two times, much more arrogant, you know, I've learned about the free market, it's a wonderful thing, and my daddy tells you it's great. Um, this time, shell shock. Shell shock, they could barely bring themselves to ask questions when I described the state of the country, he was going hungry at their age and so on, and told them that the experiment had ended. And they were just shocked. They, they, they care, partly because they're having an awful lot of money spent onto them so that they can leave this country. And it's kind of saying, well, here you are. This is what you're being given. Not that anybody is going to be stupid enough to let you leave simply because of the school you went to. Um, it's not their fault. Um, but no, and they care. And that's a shock to me. I, I've never seen Ethan boys caring. Western Superman comprehensive, much more tricky. Um, Tough crowd. My old school, which is the average comp in Oxford, uh, they absolutely care. Uh, and they particularly care when I tell them that they are still more likely to die homeless on the streets of Oxford than they are to get into my university as a student. But you have to tell them, and it's tricky whether you tell 16 or 17 year olds, that that is the reality. You're more likely to die homeless because we have to count the homeless deaths. And we know where they went to school, most of our local, who died not to be on the second highest homeless death rate after Manchester in 2019, 40. And fewer, far fewer, get into the University of Oxford other than to clean it. That's how you get the children to care. Young man there, glasses. Thank you very much. Um, who in any political party, either in this country or any other, listens to you and heeds what you're saying. <laughs> I don't. It's collective, is how I like to think about it. You're, you're sort of seeping out, and there are many of me, and they're increasing, and there are many younger ones than me. But most of them don't need to listen. Uh, because it's only in a few countries where people don't get this. You know, the USA would be interesting to do a book tour. Um, I couldn't go and talk about this in Germany. Well, they, they say, oh, it's terrible here. Do you know about in terms of the voice of the Nice and Landa? You know, you say we've levelled up, but we haven't really. But all the political parties tend to be very similar in countries. So take that politician who's to the left of Corbyn in Germany. This is a politician who ensures that trade unionists have board seats on the tops of boards, who keeps those housing walls in so the house prices don't go up get up. You can't be evicted as a renter if you pay your rent, ever. 
and the rent is controlled. Right, so the politician that makes sure that in Germany they spend one billion more a week on their health services, not 350 million, a billion extra a week is spent on Germany than we spend. We're beginning to work out the politician is, so I'm going to give it away. When she saw a 14 year old girl crying in front of her, she very cleverly chose that moment, or she may have been incredibly human, to allow 1.5 million Syrians into her country. Right? I've got nothing to teach Angela Merkel, Christian Democrat, far from that to Jeremy Corbyn. It's just we have to learn in this country that a mild mannered social democrat, less radical than Germany, which is less radical than France, which is less radical than Sweden, which is much less radical than Finland, a mild mannered social democrat called Jeremy Corbyn can be presented as the maverick antichrist because of his weird. Because in England he is. Because if you were to increase taxes by 5% from people only over 80,000, then senior management at the Guardian could no longer afford to send their daughters to North London Collegiate. And their world would end. And it may sound facetious, but that is enough for the Manchester Guardian to, in effect, highlight it's okay to vote to leave Europe and to vote for Boris. Because I want my daughter to go to North London in Egypt because all will then be okay. I have to say, I, I had my money on five minutes before Sumit mentioned Corbyn in his speech today, and it was about four minutes, 15 seconds before he said that Corbyn was the cause of all ills. Have we got another question? But whilst people are thinking of the final question, books are available. They make nights like this possible. Um, we are so lucky to have Danny here. I think this is the third or fourth time Danny's been here, and every time he comes, it's an absolute inspiration. We go away feeling empowered, and that actually, after the shit week we've had at the Tory conference this week, there is hope. And I think you'll agree, Danny, there might be hope, surely. Oh, yeah. Well, there's only one way you can go when you're the bottom. We can't go any lower, can we? Christ! When we're blaming 0.8% of the population of the trans community for being the cause of all problems, that's when you know the Tory party are, pardon my French, fucked. Question there. Young lady with glasses. Any, any thoughts on immigration? Oh, on immigration? Uh, well, thank God we still got it. We stopped having two children per couple in 1965. It's, it's, it's only immigration. Um... Uh, uh, immigration that, that saved large swathes of northern cities from being uh, demolished. But we managed to turn immigration into the reason why your children can't get into that school, the reason you can't get a house, the reason your job is cracked. Um, it's an amazing thing is that the immigration rate has jumped, and that's hope. That's hope in history. People are not coming in increasing numbers from abroad because suddenly there are huge opportunities here. Right? It's that we have slightly relaxed the rules because we desperately need people because they didn't return from the mainland after the pandemic, even though they had the right to, the last group who ever would. Because why on earth would you come back to a place that doesn't want you and pays you so badly? A third of our midwives in, in London were EU but not UK citizens. Um, so you wonder why our mortality rate is so high. Um, unequal countries get higher immigration. The US has very high immigration. It's lower in us than the US because we're not as unequal. More equal countries tend to have much lower immigration because there aren't jobs at the bottom to fill. Um, and that's what you need. However, Finland has managed to increase its immigration. Uh, the second city of Turku just passed 200,000 people for the first time in history, thanks to the immigrants, and they celebrated because Finland's at 1.3 children per couple. They celebrated. There's still racism in Finland. Remember, all their political parties are to the left of ours, almost. The Conservative mayor of Turku is to the left of Jeremy, except for Viking conscription and children having guns, but other than that, but you know, Russians. Um, so what does the UKIP party in Finland call for? 
Um, they are the softest, most mild-mannered far-right party in Europe. They want increased immigration. But, and here's the catch, increase from Spain and Portugal. That's dark and no darker. But for your UKIP party to be wanting to remain in the EU and have more immigration from elsewhere shows what is possible. Um, but it, it, it changes, but, but worldwide, uh, UN say that we're going to hit peak population for the planet of humans for the first time in world history in 2086. I think we're 10 years too late, it's 2076. Our children will be the first human beings to watch population stabilization happen. This is all on the cards already. We passed peak baby in 1990. We are running out of young people in the world. And we stopped the small boats. Uh, but one more happiness to give you. Keep going. I used to take pictures. I have a friend in Little Mesbos, and I used to go to the docks and take pictures of border control, our proud British naval vessels <coughs> in the Mediterranean, who are there to push and frighten those boats, and they're more likely to sink, carrying the people we actually need if we're going to have somebody looking after us in our old age. And of course, the British Navy is no longer in the Mediterranean. It's a Brexit bonus. <laughs> and a kind of small, small bit of hope, but you know, it can happen. Um, immigrants tend to have fewer children than the people they leave behind. The more immigration we get in the world, the faster our population will fall worldwide. And unless we're very selfish and greedy how much carbon we burn here, the quicker the planet becomes sustainable. It, it's just dealing with the fears that people have and how easy it is to stoke up those fears of other people. You know, it is really, really easy. You can say small boats and <coughs> it doesn't matter what the numbers are, which are tiny, you can get people petrified. As I've already named John Newton, I'll name, uh, I won't name. Nice old friend of mine. Name him. I can't answer. He's a member of my family. Member of my right, family. No one's going to treat anything. Right. <laughs> member of my family in his eighties. First words to me before I leave. Danny, what are we going to do about small boats? <laughs> and my words to him, I need to forget something because I've asked him before. My words to him are: You live in a very small village in the very highest part of North Yorkshire. <laughs> and the sea is currently rising at 20 centimetres a century. And you are in your 80s. And sad as it will be, you will not be here by the time that the waves are lapping at the garden at the bottom of your bungalow and you have to worry about the small, uh, small boat <laughs> approaching. But why does he worry so much about the small boats? Because that part of Yorkshire, not up there, but down in the cities of Bradford, changed. The jobs were lost, the mills went. Everything that people were proud of was destroyed. And it coincided with the mills not being able to pay anymore. So to work the night shift in the factories making cloth in Bradford, they had to import men from Pakistan to work overnight. And so this entire generation of white men from Bradford blame the arrival of the Pakistani workers in that city for the final death of industry in that once incredibly proud city. Richard and Leeds. Mm. Right, Alan Bennett went to Bradford Boys for a reason. It's Richard and Leeds grammar. And it's so easy, it's so easy to claim that's why it went wrong. It was because the Pakistanis turned up. Um, and if you were a more ignorant country and your education is not about learning but it's about jumping through hoops and you're scared and you're frightened and you can't get a house, it's easier. If you're more able, if you've got the best education system in the world because you copied the British education system in the 1960s, if your children can speak five or six languages on average by the time they're 16, or seven or eight by the time they're 18, if they're the best at solving math problems in the world, and you're Finland, it's very hard to get young Finnish people scared about immigrants. Not least because for all the other wonderful things about Finland, it can be a little bit boring. 
<laughs> and the most exciting thing that can happen in your school is somebody turns up, right, whose family don't know how to sing those particular songs that you have to sing around the piano at Christmas because it was always done. We can engineer that level of hate, which they were talking about at the Tory Party conference, hurricanes. Well, at least it wasn't swampy. It's kind of super swampy, isn't it? Like, we can only do that because we have dumbed down as a society. Somebody has to be the Texas of Europe. Somebody has to be the first to leave to show everybody else it's stupid to leave. Like, Greece can't leave because it's got a land border with Bulgaria. Bulgaria may be the only country that's like us in terms of inequality and turned its prime minister over three times in the last two years, or at least they had a decent to have an election this time. Right? But even if you've got a land border in Bulgaria, you don't need the EU. Sadly, and I can say this here, can you imagine me trying to say this in other venues? And at what point I get a beer glass in my face? Because I'm talking Britain down, aren't I? Because we are truly a wonderful country. Why am I not celebrating the best? Look at how well we did at the Olympics. So you can go sports. <laughs> We're number one in the world in terms of the gambling industry. Our gambling industry is bigger than the USA. Look at our export earnings from our casino banks. Are you not proud? They're not far from here. Look at how much money we're making from our overseas students. When I was at Sheffield, we worked out that Sheffield Union and Sheffield Hallam were making a quarter of a billion a year from overseas student fees and the five grand that the city would get from the average graduation. The hotels, the flights, everything else. 60,000 overseas students. The two universities were making more in export earnings than the whole of the metal industry of South Yorkshire. And you may think, oh, that's a fake statistic. We know the metal industry of South Yorkshire is almost dead. The metal industry of South Yorkshire is a euphemism. The clever one is to call it spoons and cutlery. What the metal industry of South Yorkshire is, is titanium shells, manacles, machine gun bullets. South Yorkshire is now an arms manufacturing centre. And yet, the two universities of South Yorkshire make more money in terms of export earnings than one of our arms industry centres. But is it making the money by actually teaching and learning? Do the students from China learn English at any point in their three years? Or are we just taking the money and running because we have to, because we need money to import food? And if that is the case, what happens when somebody begins to notice that if you pay, nobody fails their degree? And that is highly, highly worrying. Our economy increasingly depends on people gambling worldwide, and another country not relaxing its gambling laws as much as we have. It relies on people thinking our banks are safe to put their slightly more dodgy money in and not begin to think, is sterling really a safe currency and who's defending sterling? And on our universities, which depends on how well we are at selling these Adidas and Nike international best education in the world brands and hoping that nobody looks too closely at what we do. It is dangerous. We just have to get out of doing this perfectly, because I know I can trust you, without telling the rest of the world this at the moment. Because like I say, I'm not a revolutionary. I don't want it all to crash at once. I don't want my children to live through two decades of what could occur. I, I want a way out of this. And it's going to take a decade or two decades, but it's, you've got to stop believing that if we just increase productivity in what we are doing, we're going to hit those summit uplands and all will be well. And we have to keep the two-child limit because we cannot afford and children have to go cold and hungry. We just have to say no to that. And it's done by saying no to people who disagree with you. When they tell you we have to do this and it's sensible and people are shirkers and you can trust Rachel Reeves because she's got a degree in PPE. <laughs> they, no, that's right. I cannot believe we have a set of politicians who list and believe in their credibility of expertise the fact they went to university for three years. 
and then they are an economist or whatever. The worst one is the one who went to the master's degree. There's two, but I won't name the leader of the opposition. <laughs> the man who did the master's degree at Cambridge in economics, who thinks he's an absolutely genius because of it, his name is Matt Hancock. Oh, and Matt will quote his master's degree at Cambridge as evidence of his expertise. How many people do you think have failed from that master's degree? <laughs> right. How many others like Matt Hancock get through? All of them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, books are available at the front. Danny will be signing on the stage. This has been the most incredible night. There is hope until the conference next week. There is hope. <laughs> Would you please give a huge round of applause to Danny Jordan? <laughs>